Okay, everybody, it's great to see you as we continue our study on the book of Philippians. Uh, today, we are um, moving to the end of chapter number one. This is our third uh, lesson um, on our uh, study of uh, Philippians. So uh, I've entitled the study Mind Over Matter because one of the themes that Paul hits over and over is just thinking the right thoughts, having our head in the right place. And, uh, and then on top of that, Paul talks about uh, joy. We've said 13, what, 13 times, 16 times, Paul talks about joy, rejoicing. He talks about gladness. And so there's a lot here that Paul's experiencing certain emotions, certain passions that, that are not congruent with his circumstances. His circumstances would say, well, you need to be depressed. You should be hopeless. This isn't fair. Um, but Paul rises above all that because of the goodness of God. Um, and so today, as we come to the end of chapter one, we've talked about the idea that Paul um, did his opening salutation. We gave some background in week one. Last week, we talked about the main thing because Paul talked about the gospel six different times in, um, in chapter one. We'll come back to that theme later in this chapter, by the way. And then he talked about his chains, uh, the fact that Paul was under house arrest. He was chained, but he said, even though I'm in house arrest and I'm under chains, uh, that Christ is being made known. People are, um, are hearing the gospel as a result of this. And then we talked a little bit about Paul's critics. There were people that were being critical of Paul, uh, that were trying to undermine him and his authority, people saying, if you really were an apostle, God would deliver you. And so there were people that were preaching the gospel out of selfish uh, motives out of rivalry and envy. But yet Paul said, I'm just rejoicing that the gospel is being proclaimed. And someone last week rightly noted that this was not a false gospel. This was not heresy. It was someone who maybe had a perversion of the gospel. They weren't maybe teaching certain things. But Paul, I forget who made the comment last week, but Paul would not have been rejoicing if this was a false gospel. And so today, as we come to the end of chapter number one, today we're going to talk about Paul's crisis and the fact he's going to talk a little bit more about being in jail. And today I've entitled this message, Suffering because today we're gonna to talk about the challenges that come uh, in life and even in the Christian life. Um, unfortunately, there are some people and some, some traditions of the Christian faith, especially the last 50 years, that would like to teach people that if you become a Christian and you believe that you're gonna be happy, healthy, uh, wealthy, and wise, and that basically if you just have faith, um, God's gonna heal you from every, every disease, God's gonna give you financial and economic prosperity, and while I do believe that God blesses his people, I do believe that God uh, extends our borders of influence. I believe that God does uh, offer healing. But in spite of all of those things, we, we cannot allow this mentality that says that if you just have faith, you're going to have no problems. It's not true. And so Paul begins to touch on this today as we come to the latter part of chapter number one. And today we're going to cover verses 19 and following. Now, as we finished last week in verse 18, Paul was talking once again about his critics and his chains. And then he says in verse 18, what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. So once again, two times, Paul here addresses the importance of rejoicing and not just telling us what to do. He's saying, I'm rejoicing, even though I'm under house arrest and in chains. And so then he begins with the rest of chapter in verse 19, talking about his crisis and his suffering that he's going through being in jail. Let me open us in prayer, and then we'll start looking at verses 19 and following. Father, I thank you for the men and women that are joining us here today. I pray as we look to your word, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts. And specifically, as we deal with COVID and uh, all the issues of revolving that, and now as we deal with all the unrest in our country, we deal with the uh, plight of minorities, the the uh, the blowback, the, the 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 police officers and people in leadership that are doing their job well, that have a good heart, that are facing consequences because of um, of, of the actions of a few bad police officers. Uh, Lord, we just pray for all of this taking place. I pray you help us to have teachable hearts, help us to listen, help us to be part of the solution, and more specifically today, as we open your Word, I pray you speak to us in individual places of need giving us a greater, greater understanding of what you, you want us to hear and know. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So with that being said, we start looking at verse number 19, and let me uh, pull this up here. We're going to look at verse 19 today, 
and uh, starting. So it says here in verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus uh, Christ, what has happened to me will turn out from my deliverance. Now, when Paul says, I know that through your prayers and God's provision, so he's saying, as you pray for me, as you lift up, he's reminding the Philippians that prayer does make a difference, that there are some things that are contingent. Lot was saved because of the prayers and intercession of Abraham. Um, the Lord wanted to wipe out the Israelites, much like he did in the days of Noah, but Moses interceded, Moses prayed, and God answered. Hezekiah interceded for himself, asking God, and the Lord gave him, what, seven more years to his life. So there are certain elements that we face in life that are contingent upon prayer. And so uh, he says, I know through your prayers and through God's provision that what has happened to me will turn out from my deliverance. So Paul had no control over his deliverance. Now the word here, deliverance, this is interesting play on words. The word deliverance here is the word soteria. All right. It's where we get the English word soteriology. Anybody ever heard of the word soteriology? It's the study of, I'll give you a candy bar if anybody knows this. It's the study of salvation. Soteriology is the study of salvation. Soter is where we get the word salvation. So Paul says that as he prays for this in verse 19, he says, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And literally the word here is for my salvation. Now, Paul had no control over whether he would be freed or not freed. He, he had no choice over that. It was out of his control completely. But Paul knew that he would either be freed from jail, and as I shared with you last week, and I believe the week before, there is some disagreement. We don't know for sure whether Paul did, in fact, get freed from jail, took a fourth missionary journey, and then was re-jailed again before he was eventually martyred or whether Paul had an extended eight or 10 year stay in jail. We don't know for sure the answer to that. But Paul said, I'm either gonna be delivered, I'm gonna have salvation in the sense I'm gonna be freed from jail, or I'm gonna be delivered by going to heaven. Um, and so Paul is acknowledging this, that as he faces this crisis, this challenge through your prayers, which God can sometimes change realities if we pray and intercede, but also through God's provision, through the power of the spirit because it's going to take God's working to move people's hearts to make this happen either way. Then in verse number 20, he says, um, I eagerly await, and we're going to look at verses 20 through 23. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live as Christ and to die as gain, if I am to go on living in the body, this means fruitful labor for me, yet what shall I do? I do not know. Yet I am torn between the two. To, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but is more necessary for me to remain with you. Now here, Paul begins this transition about this life and death. So in verse number 20, he said, I'm trusting through your prayers and God's provision that my deliverance is going to come. Now, Paul's deliverance is going to come one or two ways. He's either going to get freed from jail, or he's going to go to heaven is what he's basically saying. And now he transitions into this little bit of an inner, inner monologue uh, in his own soul, where he's processing his own thoughts about the tension between life and death. Um, some of you have been through this. Maybe you've been diagnosed with cancer. Uh, maybe you've been looking at open heart surgery. Um, you know, and this tension can sometimes rise up in our life that says, um, do I want to keep living or am I ready to go meet the Lord? Paul is dealing with this. And regardless, as Paul deals with this, he says, I eagerly expect and hope that in, I will no way be ashamed, but I have willing uh, that I will sufficient courage that now as always Christ, verse number 20, will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. And this is a key point here because last week we said the main thing is the gospel, the good news. And here Paul says, I, I know that God will be exalted. The word here means to be glorified, to be amplified, to be magnified, that God will be lifted up whether I live or whether I die. It doesn't really matter to me, Paul says. And then in verse 21, we have this beautiful verse, which a little exercise, a little homework, if you want, that you can do is uh, memorize verse 21 if you don't already have it memorized. Paul said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. What a powerful verse. To live as Christ and to die is gain. 
Now this really is a picture and imagery of what we call lordship. Okay. Now in the Bible, the word Lord is the word kurios. It means master, um, military people. If you were in the military, you would refer to your commanding officer as Lord or kurios. If you were a slave and you had a, a slave owner, you would refer to your master as, as kurios, as Lord. Paul here says that we are to receive Christ as Savior, but also as Lord. That means master. And so too often in our world, as most of us know, even in our own hearts and lives, too often we put ourselves on the throne. We receive Jesus as our Savior, but sometimes our flesh, our will cries out, and we, um, we want to make ourselves Lord. But here, Paul says, not just he's saying that Christ is Lord, but he says, if I live, it is for Christ. Christ is the most important thing. And if I die, that is for gain. Why? Because I'm going to be with Christ. Um, so it's not money. It's not power. It's not popularity. It's not politics. It's not his own self-esteem. It's not his goals. Paul says, if I'm going to live, it's for Christ. He is really what is most important. And then in verse 22, if I go on living in the body, let me pull the verse up here. He says, if I go on living in the body, in verse 22, um, or verse number 20, uh, I, to live as Christ, to die as gain, 21. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. So Paul says, if I continue um, you know, living, if God allows me to stay on this earth, then I'm going to do more kingdom work. There's going to be more converts. The churches are going to be edified. Uh, I'm going to be able to challenge some false teachers. So there's more labor that's going to come out of this, more fruit for the kingdom. Um, what shall I choose? I do not know. Now you see the inner dialogue or monologue that Paul's having with himself here. Which do I want? Do I want to live and to continue to face suffering and hardship and challenging challenges and loss? Or do I want this to be gone with this place and to go and be with my Lord? Later in chapter three, we're going to read where Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. What a beautiful verse. And so he's going to revisit this theme later in the book where he talks about this tension between being of the world um, or in the world, but not of the world. Okay. So he says, he goes on to say in verse number 23, um, what should I do? And then in verse 23, I am torn between the two. Do you see it there? Verse 23, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it is more necessary for me to stay. Now, let's just camp out on verse 23 for a moment because there are some word plays here and there are some powerful words that I'm going to, to talk about here. First of all, when he says in verse 23, I am torn or I am hard pressed, the word here in the, in the Greek is used to describe just what it says, to be, to be pressed in. Many of you know the story in Acts chapter 7 where, where Stephen is preaching to the Sanhedrin and he starts to challenge them and confront them. And they basically start to reject what he says. And he calls them a stiff-necked people. And the Bible says that they covered their ears. They covered their ears. And they said, we don't want to hear any more of this. And they covered their ears before they finally snapped. And they began to stone Stephen. This is the same word we have here. It's this idea that says, I, I can't hear any more. It's, it's turning the television off. I can't take any more of this. I'm done with it. It's, it's laying down the remote. I, I just can't hear anymore. It's just too much. So Paul here is saying, I'm torn. I'm hard pressed. It's so difficult. I can't hardly process the challenge that I'm facing about whether I want to continue to stay in this world to endure the challenges or whether I want to be with my Lord. And then in verse number 23, he says, I'm, I'm torn. I'm hard pressed between the two. I desire to depart. All right. Now, the word depart here is the word analyo in the Greek, uh, A-N-A-L-Y-O, analyo. And this word is used only, I believe, two times in the Bible. I may be wrong on that, but I think it only appears twice in Scripture. But it is used multiple times in extra-biblical Greek literature. So when the Greeks would write stories, plays, all kinds of, of documents that we have from Greek literature, this is a common word. And let me tell you some ways it's used. It is used to describe um, a, say, a ship that is untied and set sail. When they untie the ship and the ship sets sail and departs, 
It is anal, uh, anal, 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 anal. It is this word that says departing. When a farmer unyokes his oxen, he's farming a field, he has two oxen, he has the yoke that goes across the back of both, both oxen. He frees his oxen, he releases them from the yoke. It is the same word. Um, when, um, when a prisoner is set free from prison, it is the same word. Greek literature, this word is used often to describe someone who is truly released, someone that is given a sense of freedom from their burdens. And so when Paul said in verse number 23, I'm torn between the two, I desire to depart, Paul is saying, I, I want this freedom. I want to be done with all of this. I, I want to be done with the arguments and the conflict. I want to be done with the anger. I want to be done with the violence. I want to be done with the sin. I want to be done with all of this. And I just want to be in my Lord, uh, with my Lord in the new kingdom. All right? And so Paul has this inner tension he's facing inside of his soul. Now, as he processes this out loud, we transition to verse 24 to 26. All right? As he continues to process this inner turmoil that he's facing, uh, we read in verse 24, but it is more necessary for me that I remain in the body. So notice what Paul's saying here. It's not about me. Because as you, as you read the words, Paul is saying here that, that I want, I really do want to depart. I want to be with the Lord. I, I, you know, I want to be with my God. But it is more necessary for me, uh, or for you, he says, that I remain. So Paul is saying that I'm needed here for other people. All right? It's not just about me. Um, boy, I don't remember. It was maybe... I don't know, it's been at least a year or so, I, and I forget where I came across this quote, but it was shortly after I moved here to Arizona, and um, knowing that God was calling me uh, to, to leave uh, my church I'd been at for 20-some years and to move here to Arizona, uh, but I came across a quote, and it might have been Henry Nowen, but let me just share the essence of the quote. He said, your life is a gift to be shared, not a possession to be held on to. And that, that verse I'm telling you, or that quotation has been alive inside of me for the past year or more. My life is a gift, not that I'm someone special, but my life is a gift. I'm here to edify, to encourage, to challenge, to confront, to teach, to preach, to lead, to shepherd. God has given me, the Lord has saved me. The Lord changed me. I've been born again through the love of Jesus Christ. And, and because I'm a new creation in Christ, my life is a gift to be shared, not a possession to be held on to. In other words, my life is not my own. It's not just my happiness, what I want, what I need, but I need to view my life as a gift that God wants to share with other people. And, and I think Paul has the same experience. Paul says, listen, it is for your benefit, for your benefit, I need to stay here, even though I want to depart and be with my Lord. He says, it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And I would also say for you, every single one of you that are joining me in this, in this teaching, your life is a gift from God. And when the Lord saves us and the Lord comes into our life, God wants to use our life as a gift for other people. Now, that doesn't mean we go around correcting everybody because, as you know, the phrase, you're God's gift, can also be a negative thing, right? It can come across very condescending. I'm, I have something to tell you. Let me fix your life. Let me tell you, you better get your stuff together. And people that, that possess that attitude with arrogance and not humility, it can be a very damning thing. And I use that word very literally. It can be very damnable when you have a person who thinks they're God's gift to this earth in the sense that they have to correct everybody and there's no humility. So that's not what I'm saying. But whether you teach a class, whether you love your grandchildren, whether you run errands for your neighbor, whether you're praying and interceding for someone or something, your life is a gift and you have something to offer this world. And Paul is articulating this, even though I desire to go and be with the Lord, he said, I know it's more necessary for me to remain in the body. Why? In verse 25, he spells it out. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you in your progress and joy in the faith. 
So now Paul is being more specific in why he feels like he needs to stay for them. Let's look at 25. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. So he says, I believe that God's going to keep me here. And he says, I will continue with all of you in your progress and joy. Now, remember last week, we talked about this theme of progress. There were two times it came up in verse number six, where he talks about carrying on your faith to completion. And then later on, he said um, in verses nine through 11, where he talked about your progress, your growth and knowledge, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This also is a theme that we're going to come back to later in the book of Philippians because Paul wants to see the church continue to maturate. He wants to see the church mature and to grow up uh, to become more Christ-like. So I want to see your progress and also, here's our word again, joy. All right? I'm redundant here, but we're going to see this over and over and over again in the book of Philippians. While Paul is writing in jail and while we'll get in a moment— we think the Philippians are facing persecution. Paul's talking here about joy, joy, joy. So that, he says in verse 26, through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ should abound on account of me. So in other words, Christ is going to be glorified and you're going to be edified by my life and hopefully by being with you again, um, that you're going to be edified in your faith. And that is going to have a ripple effect that you're going to share and that Christ is going to be glorified. Now, the point of all this is that it's not about Paul, all right? Um, if you have a Bible, let's, let me, if you're taking notes, let me give you a few here. Remember verse number 20, he says that Christ is exalted. And verse 21, he said to live as Christ, to die as gain. And verse 22, he speaks about fruitful labor. And now in verse 25, he talks about your progress. Verse number 20, Christ is exalted. Verse 21, to live is Christ. Verse 22, fruitful labor will occur if I stay alive and I'm on this earth. 25, for your progress. Here's the point. As Paul's writing this letter, it's not about Paul. It's truly about other people. Um, several years ago, I came across this analogy. And when I actually preached on this passage, it's probably been close to 20 years ago. I preached a sermon on this book and uh, this passage. And I shared the acrostic joy, J-O-Y which Paul talks about multiple times here. And I share that, that part of the secret to having joy in our life is this. And if you're taking notes, you can write it down. And Rick, you just need to memorize it. Okay, Rick, you got to just memorize this. All right. Here's the key to joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself third. Jesus first to live as Christ, others second. I need to listen. I need to see. I need to empathize. I need to be concerned about others and yourself third. That is truly how Paul is living his life. Not just talking a good game, but this is how Paul is living in the book of Philippians. Jesus first, other second, yourself third. And I actually had a lady who went to be with the Lord a few years ago and I did her, I did her funeral. And um, she said, Jim, uh, that, that, that acrostic changed my life. And until her last dying day, she lived by that mantra, Jesus first, other second, yourself third. Mother Teresa once said, if we worry too much about ourselves, we do not have time for others. And obviously, when we have pain and we have struggle and we have fear and we have anxiety, we're naturally going to pay attention to ourselves. We're going to be acutely aware of what we're feeling and thinking. Listen, no one wants to suffer and have hardship. Nobody wants to face life or pain. No one likes to have their body breaking down. But in the midst of all this, my friends, there's an opportunity to remind ourselves that truly Christ is first, others second, yourself third. And I believe that when we live this way, which is not always easy to do, we often find that supernaturally through the Holy Spirit, that God does give us this joy that's unspeakable, this peace that surpasses all understanding and allows us to experience something in our soul that is beyond explanation. All right, now let's transition to this last section, which is uh, 27 and following. So as we come to the end of chapter number one, here's what Paul says to us, all right? Whatever happens, Conduct yourself in a matter. So Paul, once again, he's not in control about whether he's going to be freed from jail or not. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. 
then whether I come and see you or hear about you in my absence, absence, you will know, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as in the faith of the gospel. This is a transitional verse here where Paul is going to begin to talk about unity and the importance of standing together without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed that they and, and that you will be saved and by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not just to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Now think about that. It has been granted. It has been gifted to you on behalf of Christ, not just to believe in him, but to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw that I had and now here that I still have. So let's talk about these last verses here. First of all, in verse 27, Paul says, whatever happens, it's for the sake of the gospel. Two different times in verse 27, he uses the word gospel. Now, we shared last week that chapter number one, uh, this theme of the gospel is, is a primary theme. Um, it appears six different times in chapter number one. Paul talks about tr uh, gospel. 18 times in chapter one, he talks about Christ. Three times he talks about preaching. Now, the gospel truly is the good news message of Jesus Christ. The word gospel literally means good news. Now, I touched on this last week, and I did not get into it, so I want to cycle back and talk about this idea of the gospel, because this is a core conviction of mine, um, that I believe that the gospel, I'm telling you my interpretation of scripture and my understanding, and, and you can disagree with this, but I believe, based upon Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, that the gospel truly is the good news story of Jesus Christ. It's not, it is not a formula of three or four verses that we highlight and that we just parrot and we give people. I think that, yes, there are certain verses that have value. John 3, 16, obviously. John chapter number one, the Romans road. There's a lot of passages that speak to salvation that I think are very, very powerful and that should be shared. But I do think that we have done a disservice when we reduce the gospel to a formula that Jesus never gave us. He never said, these are, this is the exact prayer you have to pray to be saved. He never said, these are the exact things you have to do. And, and for example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it simply says, you just simply have to believe and receive Jesus to be saved. Romans 10 says, you have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. There's nothing there about receiving or believing. It just says, confess, and then it says, I'm sorry, it does say, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Uh, Joel says, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter, in his sermon in the book of Acts, says, you must uh, repent in order to be saved. So in other words, we have all these different verses that talk about salvation, and there's different words and phrases attached to them. And people tend to grab their favorite verse, their favorite passage or passages, and they say um, that, um, that this is what we have to do to believe. And so all of those verses are true, but I don't think it's an exact formula. I think it is the story of God's love and God's grace. When Jesus ministered to the woman caught in the act of adultery, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the woman at the well, he didn't give her a formula. He simply engaged her, talked about her sin. The Bible says the woman went back and many people believed in Jesus as Messiah because of the woman's testimony. Well, Jesus never said, you've got to believe, you've got to repent. You've got to confess with your mouth. You've got to believe in your heart. So we need to share the story of Jesus. And here's the powerful thing about a story that I, that, I, that, I, that I think about, is that when you tell a story, sometimes there are certain elements of the story that speak to one person that don't speak to another person. Those of us that are married, we can watch a movie with our spouse, and we can both say, what a great movie. And one of us may say, I really enjoyed that scene. And another one may say, well, I really enjoyed this scene. One element of the movie may move one person to tears and not another person. Also, sometimes you can watch a movie or read a novel, a, a book, and you may read it a second time and, and the novel and the movie speaks to you differently or a different scene that didn't speak to you the first time speaks to you the next time. That's the gospel. The gospel is so big. It's the story of Jesus, of God sending his son into this world, of Christ loving us, dying on the cross, his blood making an atonement for our sin. And so, yes, we need to hold on to our favorite verses and we need to share that. But the gospel, as Paul's talking about here, he doesn't give us a formula. I think that's the pattern throughout the Bible. And my conviction is, is that, that 
salvation is not just a barcode that we go through. It's not just saying the right words and saying these uh, certain verses and saying a specific prayer. It's, it's embracing the, the message of Jesus. It's embracing Jesus himself into our life for the forgiveness of our sins. It's believing, it's receiving. That is the good news. That is the story of the gospel that Paul here is so centric in what he is teaching and preaching to the people. Um, so anyway, as Paul says this in verse 29, uh, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Now, I don't want to let this go either. In a manner worthy of the gospel. What's he saying here? He's saying, listen, we need to be sure we're living our lives. Living our lives in a way that reflect Jesus. I think that sometimes we're tempted to talk too much and show too little. Um, you know, I, I've said it, I say it a lot. St. Francis Preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. We need to be sure that we are living our life in such a way that, um, that people can see, see the gospel in us. Not just hear the gospel, but see the gospel. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then when I come to see you or hear about you, verse 20, 29, I will know that you stand firm. Now, this is a transitional verse. That you will stand firm in one spirit, striving together with all of God's people. Okay? Now, um, this word here, stand firm here, this is a theme that's going to spill over into next week's lesson in chapter two. This idea of being together. 16 times in the, um, uh, 16 times in the, um, uh, the book of Philippians, it talks about being together with one another or together. So Paul here is beginning a transition where he's talking about unity. So we will be stand firm in one spirit. And then he says, striving together. Both of these phrases are speaking about the importance of unity. And let me just give you my little tangent on unity. When you look at the Lord's Prayer, not, I'm sorry, not the Lord's Prayer as in our Father who art in heaven, but Jesus' extended prayer in John 17 as he's in the Last Supper. One of the things that Jesus prays is he prays for unity. He says, Father, may you make them one as you and I are one. Part of what the Trinity teaches us is not just a doctrinal belief that God is three in one. Too often we make the, the, the Trinity just this intellectual doctrine that we have to subscribe to. The Trinity teaches us that God by his very nature is in relationship. That God by his very nature is a relational deity and that, that, that the Father honors and glorifies the Son. The Son glorifies the, the Father. Jesus said, the Spirit, one greater than I, is coming after me talking about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit elevates Jesus. So in this Trinity, you see this, with the, the, the word in ancient literature is perichoresis. You see this the divine dance where the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are in unity together, and they're constantly lifting each other up. And part of our maturity and part of when the church and when we are believers are at our best is when we have a strong sense of unity. And it's not about us. It's not about our individual agendas, but we are working together for the corporate good of the kingdom of God. So here's my message I want you to hear. Jesus never, ever prayed for church growth, but he did pray for church unity. And Jesus... I think he never prayed for church growth because he just assumed that was going to happen when we do our, our business. He says, I am building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But Jesus did pray for unity because unity is something that we have a measure of control over that we don't always do a very good job with. And so here, Paul begins this transition that we're going to talk about in great detail next week, this idea of the church being unified, of people being more selfless rather than selfish, about looking to Jesus as our model and our example of living a selfless life. Because when the church is unified, when we are together, when we are unified, let me tell you something, there is nothing that can stop the power of the gospel when the church is together. And so here, Paul begins this transition that we're going to talk about next week. Um, in verse 27, being of one spirit, striving together. The word striving there is where we get the word, uh, it's the word uh, politico. It's where we get the English word politics. It carries this idea of, of actually moving together and, and um, living this life. And then he said, striving together uh, as one for the gospel. And look at verse 28. This is relevant. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Uh, Paul is encouraging and exhorting the people not to be governed by fear. And uh, I think it's really relevant in light of what we um, um, 
what, what we're seeing right now in our country because it can be very frightening. But we need to be sure that we're not governed by a spirit of fear. Uh, on a side note, um, just yesterday morning, uh, I live in Vestantia. Those of you in the valley, you know, Vestantia is outside of Sun City West. I live in Vestantia and we have a, um, a social page where people can interact. And uh, there was some guy on there that said, you know, hey, uh, you know, I think we need to, you know, those of us that got guns, we need to get our guns together and we need to round up to protect our neighborhood. You know, it was almost like trying to start a militia, you know, for our neighborhood. And it was, you know, honestly, it was rather scary because I don't think fear and guns are always a good, um, a good mixture. And, um, and so some people responded, uh, but there was a police officer who, who graciously stepped in and did a wonderful job channeling the conversation to say, you know, there are some training programs we can take people through. We don't need to go, you know, monitoring the streets with guns. Let's just do these other programs. But the point being is that there is a tremendous amount of fear that we're feeling. And fear tends to drive us to react and to overreact. Where I think when we're walking in the spirit, we are a bit more controlled and a bit more balanced. And I shared what happened yesterday as an example, because there's clearly a response of this person that initiated this conversation was responding in fear. And there was a sense of, I'm going to take control of the situation. And there were people going, yeah, hell yeah, go get them, right? Let's go. And then there were other people like, hold on a second. You know, I, I don't necessarily want you walking down my street with guns. You know, uh, I appreciate the spirit. But and then there was a level headed person that was experienced in law. Actually, a couple of them that came in and sort of channeled the discussion to say, listen, there's a way we can go about this that is safe, that is reasonable, that is also trying to protect our neighborhood uh, without just responding in a, in a these are my words, a fleshly manner. And so I, as I read this verse, it just reminds me of the world we're living in. And Paul said, without being frightened, not because we don't have a right to be concerned, but when we are governed by fear, we tend to overreact um, and we tend to react in unhealthy ways because fear triggers all kinds of emotions inside of us, fight, flight, or flee. But when we walk by faith, we're much more tempered, we're much more discerning, much more wise, okay? So then he says, um, let's go back and we're almost done here. Let me pull the verse back up. Uh, Without being frightened in any way, those who oppose us, this is a sign to them that will be destroyed uh, and is also that you are being saved by God. Uh, so once again, we have this security. And part of the reason I think Paul is saying we don't have to be afraid is because we know this world is not our home. In chapter three, Paul Paul is saying, uh, Paul is going to say in chapter number three, our citizenship is not our citizenship is in heaven. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And so while while we want to to live and we don't want our homes to be looted, there's nothing wrong with being concerned about that. What Paul is saying though is we don't need to be governed by fear, because it is assigned to those that are being destroyed. But you will be saved in that by God. This is not all there is. For it has been granted to you, and someone posted on the comments, it has been, uh, it's, it's been gifted to you. I'll, I'll do the, the, the phrase in a second if you look in the comments. It's been granted to you a privilege in order to suffer on behalf of Christ. All right? Now, suffering itself um, is not necessarily a gift, but what God does in the midst of the suffering is often a gift, since you are going through the same struggle that you saw we had. Now, in verse 29 and 30, um, it says here, it's been granted to you not just to believe, but to suffer. And then it talks about the word struggle here. Now, the word struggle here in verse number 30 is the word agoneo. It's where we get the word agony. And it's the exact same word that is used to describe Jesus as he intercedes and prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. So if you have a Bible... And you look at verse 30, it says, since you are going through the same struggle, I want you to circle that word struggle. It's been granted privilege to you on behalf of Christ, not just to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Later in chapter number three, uh, Paul is going to say that that we share in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, But it says, as you suffer, you are going through the same struggle that you saw I had, and by inference, the same struggle that Jesus had. The word struggle here 
is the same word where we get this agna, uh, agona, which we get the word agony. It's the same word used to describe Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, when Jesus prayed in agony in the garden. And so Paul says, you're going to suffer. It's a privilege, not because suffering itself, but because of the good that comes out of our suffering. Because when we endure suffering, what are some of the things that come out of it? Well, often there is growth and maturity. This is James chapter number one. Count it a privilege, or it says, consider it pure joy, James says in chapter one, when you have to endure tribulations and sufferings of various kinds. First uh, Peter chapter number four says, why are you surprised that you're suffering? Because, because God often uses pain um, and hardship in order to bring about growth. And, and no one wants to go through hardship, but it's just part of the deal on this side of heaven. And so as we endure conflict and struggle and strife, and if, as, as we have to go through struggle, as Paul says, and notice in verse number 30, since you are going through the same struggle, so the inference here, and we believe, most theologians believe, that the Philippians were facing some form of persecution. He said, the same struggle that you saw I had. Well, what struggle did Paul have? Remember in Acts 16, Paul was rejected when the young girl, the demon-possessed person was healed. Paul was arrested. He was thrown in jail. He faced a, a mob of people that were out to get him. So now we think that the, that the Christians in Philippi are now facing this kind of um, this kind of backlash, and they're scared, they're struggling, and Paul is not with them there in person to comfort them. But Paul says, "You are going through the same struggle that I had, the same struggle." Remember, the word struggle is the word where we get the word agony that Jesus went through, and uh, now I hear that I still have. So Paul is saying, "Listen, we're all on the same boat. We're all taking the same ride." Jesus, the Son of God, had to come into this world, and he had to endure struggle. He had to endure conflict. He had to endure suffering. Paul, chosen by an apostle, had to endure struggling. He had to endure conflict, had to endure persecution. This Sunday, I'm starting a sermon series on the book of Jeremiah called Exile and Hope. Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet. Jeremiah says, I don't want to be a prophet. God said, don't worry, Jeremiah. I'll be with you, and I'll protect you. You know what happened to Jeremiah? He got beat, he got thrown in stocks, he got thrown into a cistern, he got persecuted, he got rejected. And uh, in about week number seven, I'm going to do a message where Jeremiah prays and says, God, what's up? You said you were going to protect me. You said you were going to keep me safe. Look at all the stuff that's happened to me. All I'm saying is that when we become a Christian, it does not exempt us from problems. And we don't need to lose sight of the fact that in the midst of the problems, there is so much good that God gives to us. There's so much that we have to be grateful for. Yet on this side of heaven, our world, our life is always going to be sprinkled with challenges, with conflicts, with agony. But Paul says that we can expect this and we can be grateful even for sufferings because sufferings produce growth. In sufferings, God can be glorified. In sufferings, God often works through our life to do a greater good in the lives of other people. Because at the end of the day, my friends, it's not about us. And someday we're gonna realize really how, how, how immaterial we are uh, when we go and stand before the presence of the Lord. So as I wrap up today, I'll take any questions that you have or comments that you wanna add, and then we will wrap up. Paul wrote down here, uh, I strive to live in Christ, but I must admit that watching my Chicago in total chaos Saturday night uh, and some continues, puts fear in me, which starts to consume my thinking. In those moments, I forget that I am first a vessel of God's spirit. Oh, thank you, Paul, for your transparency and honesty. By no means would I suggest that there should not be any kind of emotion or concern inside of us. And listen, fear is a human emotion. There are 365 times in the Bible, it's been said one for every day of the year, a verse for every day of the year that says fear not. 365 times the Bible says fear not because fear is a natural human emotion. And when you go back to human beings in caveman era, fear is a good thing in some cases because fear can in fact lead to good. It gets us out of bad situations. So 
by no means would I say, Paul, that we should feel a sane when those moments get to us. But I think you you hit a point here when you said, when when I when I dwell upon it, fear puts me in a position where it starts to consume my thinking. That's where the battle is fought, where we allow the fear to consume us, and we start going down that track of what if, what is shoulda coulda, how these things may play out. That's when we that's when it can become unhealthy. And um, you have to constantly reboot yourself to get back and to get centered. Reading the scriptures, saying your prayers, being in community, attending this Bible study, those things help us to get re-centered and rebalanced. But you know what? Our flesh will continue to drift back and forth. It's like the verse that says in, in 1 Peter, cast all of your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. The word cast literally means cast as we think about fishing. And so as I say to people, you know why it says cast? Because we cast our cares upon the Lord, and then what do we do? We reel them back in. And then we have to cast them again. And then we tend to reel them back in. It's a process. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says he's facing criticism from the church. And you know what Paul said? I'm not going to defend myself. And yet three times, Paul starts to go into a, tant, a, ranch and, a, 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 a tangent and a rant defending himself. And finally, Paul says, I'm talking like a madman. I can't believe I'm doing this because Paul says, I'm not going to defend myself, but his flesh kicks in and he starts to defend himself. We are vessels, human vessels. We are, we are but dust. And so Paul and to all of us, yes, fear is going to rise up inside of us, but it's important that we are not governed by fear. And we don't allow our fear to justify hatred inside of us. And we don't allow fear to, to justify unhealthy words and rhetoric, and we don't allow fear to drive our behaviors. We have to fight this flesh and spirit battle of trying to stay centered on the Lord. Uh, as Danielle posted, for the spirit that God has given us is not one of fear, but of one of power and of love and of self-control. But we have to walk in the spirit, and that is a daily, minute-by-minute, moment-by-moment choice that we make to stay centered and grounded in Christ. Great. Thank you. Anybody else have comments or questions? All right. Well, we are right at an hour. And so thank you all for participating. I would give you two pieces of homework this week. All right. Um, actually, three pieces of homework. Number one um, is, uh, is to continue to read forward in chapter number two. And you might consider rereading chapter number one, everything we talked about. And then we're going to start chapter number two next week, I believe, verses one through 11. Second piece of homework is if you do not yet have it memorized, I would encourage you to commit um, Philippians chapter one, verse 21 to memory. It's a very short verse. You can write it on a three by five card and just commit it to memory. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a very simple verse, but it's very powerful. Um, and then the third piece of homework is try to join us again next week. All right. Um, and then for those of you here in Arizona, in two weeks from today, which is what, the 17th of June? On the 17th of June, I am going to start teaching this Bible study live here at the church. Now, uh, we're going to be in Hoover Hall. We're going to have tables set up. We'll be able to accommodate about 30 people. And so if you want to come on site and participate in the Bible study, we'll have two people per table. Um, or one person per table. And so we'll start doing some live teaching here. So I'll start teaching this live. As I'm teaching it live, I'll be streaming it also live on Zoom. So you can either continue to watch in the format you're watching. Now, this is not next week. It is in two weeks. So you can watch the stream on YouTube, on, on, on Zoom, just as we're doing. You can come and participate live as we start layering on live teaching here at the church. Or thirdly, I'll continue to be uploading the videos to, uh, to YouTube, where we've been having uh, over 100 people viewing them and participating with the Bible study online. Okay, so that's what's coming down the pike. All right, um, with all that being said, let's go ahead and close in prayer. And uh, because you're on the screen, Rick or Maria, would one of you be willing to pray for us? If you're not, that's fine, but would one of you be willing to pray for us, Rick? So can you close us in prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the teachings of Pastor Jim and the information that was shared this morning. We pray that we might take that as additional knowledge, but also gain understanding and how to apply it to our lives. We thank you in the gracious 
powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Rick. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, don't hesitate to shoot forth questions if you have questions about something we've covered. If you read a commentary that says something different than I covered, don't hesitate to bring that up. Honestly, that doesn't, that, uh, that doesn't bother me. I think sometimes we have healthy dialogue. Not everything is black and white. There's different opinions. Just as I shared about, you know, did Paul have a fourth missionary journey? We don't know. There's speculation. But uh, in some of these verses, they're translated. People have different takes on them. So the, whole, the goal here is that we have dialogue. And um, I'm hopefully not just preaching at you, but hopefully we can all learn together. So uh, next week, be prepared to have any questions you might have. If you do, if you don't, we'll jump right into chapter number two. So thank you for joining us. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.